Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for A Dram of Outlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 100, season 3, episode 1. It is so exciting. We are finally back into an Outlander season after more than a year and a novella, a book, and a big book read-along for us here. How many times have you viewed episode one of season three? I have now seen it four and a half times since it went on demand at less than 24 hours ago. I have numerous notes, and my plan for the season of the TV show for the podcast is not to do a blow-by-blow review per se. I was trying to get away from that last season, and I like the groove I found in the book read-alongs for focusing on historic events, medicine and science, and kind of giving an overview of what happened. I want to say just off the top that I absolutely unequivocally love this episode. You know that I can be critical if there's something that I don't like or I don't think flows well. I am stunned by the absolute subtlety of Sam Hewen, where until they got to the farmhouse and even through that, there was very little dialogue. He didn't speak hardly at all, yet the emotions and his circumstances were right there. You could feel it. I loved how the change in tone from his memories, even though they were chaotic, that they were vibrant. And the fight scene between him and Black Jack Randall, I'll get to that in a minute. Wow. But the desolation that Jamie had as he laid on that battlefield, growing weaker and weaker, not quite dead, but not feeling very alive either. And to be trapped under that body and it got cold and dark that April 16th, 1746. And when he had the vision of Claire is when Rupert found him alive. And then we had a bit more dialogue But seeing that suffering and the doomed battle, wow, it was a horror. Those men went to their death knowing there would not be a win for the Jacobites that day. I'm pretty sure they were quite resigned to the fact that there is no way they were coming out of it, but they were committed They were traitors. What were they supposed to do, right? And there's so much information on Culloden. You can visit it. Um, National Trust for Scotland has a great deal of information. There is an amazing live action almost, I don't know how else to say, um, play-by-play from the vantage point of the Jacobites and from the Redcoats. And you can see how the battle played out from both sides simultaneously. It's pretty remarkable. And walking through it is kind of mind-bending. And then walking along the moor, I recommend you do it in solitude by yourself Just take it in. 
I mean, I remember standing there and trying to imagine what it was like for those men, barefoot mostly, cold, bitter cold. And they were armed with tools and axes and swords against guns, bayonets, artillery. Yeah, there's no way they could win. And Bonnie Prince Charlie got away and he was exiled for the rest of his natural life. Wow. But to see this played out through the messy memories of a dying Jamie Fraser. And when they got to that farmhouse and Rupert stood up for everybody. And he was able-bodied, but he stayed. He didn't think he could get far anyway, but he stayed knowing that he was going to die. Eventually, the redcoats would show up, and they did. It was a couple of days that they were holed up there. Jamie could not stand. He could barely move. He had lost immense amount of blood from his leg wound. He already had a fever and infection. He was dying. And as they took them out one by one, taking their names down and to be shot honorably as soldiers, that was a nice touch. And just happens to be that Lord Melton is Lord John Gray's older brother. And there was that debt of honor against his family for Red Jamie when Jamie had broken his arm near Cary Eric, but did not kill him that night and let him go. So Melton had to let Jamie go even though the Crown would have loved to have had a high-up Jacobite officer, Hal couldn't do that. His family debt had to be relieved. So he sent Jamie in a wagon back to Lallybrack under the cloak of night, back to Jenny and Ian Murray. It was so heart-wrenching because Jamie just wanted to die. His whole purpose was to die. He sent Claire away so he could die. (sighs) We don't know what happened to Murtaugh. He's presumed dead. We saw him for a moment, and that was it. So is Murtaugh still alive out there? Hmm. I guess we'll find out, because we did not get any confirmation that he was dead at all. I found it so amazing seeing that pain of waiting to die as a soldier, knowing that you're damned and spending that time. And when in Jamie's memories, they were completely disordered, but looking at him at the stone circle after he let Claire go and her plaid was on the ground and he picked it up and he smelled it. He couldn't believe she was actually gone, but she was. And his whole mission was to not survive that day. But he's very hard to kill that Jamie Fraser. And he survived and he survived the ride to Lallybrock And he got back into the arms of Jenny and Ian, who were overjoyed to see him. And as this is going on, Claire and Frank's story is being woven in and out. We're seeing both. Now, Jamie's is playing out in a couple of days. That's it. His is very short, where Frank and Claire's is over many months. 
and they had moved to Boston. And it shows the settling of the home and her getting more and more advanced pregnancy, right? But she's miserable and she puts on a smiley face. But when no one's looking, she's miserable. She can't even figure out how to use the modern appliances very well. It takes her quite a bit of time to get a hang of that again. And I think one of the most beautiful and funny things that they did, and Ron wrote this episode, huzzah, good job, (laughs) was when she couldn't get the stove to light properly, she went and bought wood for the fireplace and cooked over an open flame in the fireplace because that she knew how to do. She had spent three years living rough, basically. And even if she was inside of a residence, uh, they didn't have electricity, didn't have gas stoves, everything you had to do for yourself. And to see her own desolation. We only saw a few days of Jamie's, but we saw hers play out over the majority of the pregnancy And I can't imagine losing the love of your life, leaving everything that you wanted and held dear because Jamie had meant to die and she knew what was going to happen in the Highlands. Would they have been able to survive a famine and a cleansing? That's not what Jamie wanted. So he sent her away. One of the things that we've seen throughout the series is the nods to the feminist threads and Claire being really out of her own time, even when she is in her own time. And she wasn't raised with the social norms and mores. She was raised by her uncle around the world, and she was used to having a place and having a say and participating. And she's in the late 1940s in Boston, and at every turn, she is being treated horribly so just because she's a woman. Even her neighbor who meets up with her when she's getting the wood out of her trunk to cook in her fireplace talks about, as long as the husband likes it, oh, mine only wants me to do X and Y, and you know, look pretty for the boss. And this is mortifying to Claire. She likes to think that Frank is progressive and he is more than most because he married her in the first place and she was always very forthright, always wanted to participate, always at the forefront. She didn't shy away from things, but he was still a man of his time. And it was hard for him because I think he would have loved for her to have been more of the wifey And she wasn't adjusting well to that at all. And when they go to a faculty event and the dean of Harvard is there and the other women are not speaking at all. They're just sitting there while the men are talking. And the dean is talking to the men and to Frank and then Claire pipes in about the next election and what she was reading And this really offended the dean. And he said to Frank that he needs to pay more attention to what his wife is reading. And Frank does speak up for her. He did. He jumped in and said that she had been a combat nurse in World War II. And the dean took it as her being patriotic. And now she gets to be in maternal bliss and do what she's really good at and meant to do. Now, hats off to stay-at-home mamas who stay at home the length of their children being grown up or for their marriage, because that's what works for you and your spouse and hats off to women who work their entire life, whether they have children or not. It's a complicated world and humans are complex creatures and women have always been meant to participate and work and be valued in their society. And after world war two, It was as if the rug was just pulled out from under them because the women ran like the U.S. when the men were at war. 
women did everything at every level because those jobs had to be done whether or not there were enough men here to do them. And as soon as the war was over and the men were returning in droves, women were really subjugated and they were put below the men. And all of a sudden we had this stay-at-home stereotype. Women did not do well under that. We had a lot of women becoming pill addicts and alcoholics, and they were very unhappy, not being productive and not being listened to when they had been very much the fabric of what kept this country going. And Claire had that in her native country. That's what she did. And to come here and to be suppressed or oppressed was really difficult for her. And I think the way that they showed the oppression uh, on the episode was to really make Claire have that steel for her to become a doctor and for her not to listen and to be held back because of current social mores. And I totally get why it's put in there. You know, and as we moved through the episode, she and Frank have a huge row. And she tells him she wants to become an American citizen. And he doesn't think so because his job gives them residency as long as he has it. And then they have this complete blow up. It's never about the thing that you're talking about, is it? I mean, for those of us who've been married for a long time or in a relationship that's complicated, things happen. And when you're in a rough patch, ugh, it's hard to talk about them. And it's hard not to just be angry. But it was about him not being connected to her. And she was pulled back and inside herself and she didn't want him to touch her much she didn't say I love you and he thought when he made that deal and they came to America that it was going to be a switch that was flipped and all of a sudden he would get Claire back well Claire is a completely different person and she's pregnant with somebody else's baby and she spent more continuous time with Jamie than she did with Frank in the six years they had been seven years-ish, they had been married. On the show, it was five years apart because of the war. But she spent more continuous time with Jamie, even though she had been married to Frank longer. So who knew her better? Who really understood her? She grew up during the war and came into her own, but she spent very little time with Frank. And when they were just about to start doing that, she went through the stones to Jamie. And he really got to see the more mature her, the woman that she was meant to turn into. And Frank didn't really get to see that or participate, but he loves her with all his heart. And at the end, when there's the birth of Brianna, it was so infuriating and more along that feminist thread and of what's going to make Claire move was how the doctor treated her, mistreated her, gave her twilight sleep without her consent, and in fact, against her will. That's going to be foundational for Claire's decision-making in the future. And I thought it was so cool for them to do something where she would wake up and not be pregnant. I get why Ron put it in there, because it was brilliant, actually, to loop back around that the last time she woke up not pregnant, her baby had died. And she asked if her baby was dead to the nurse, and then Frank comes in with baby Brianna. Oh, that was wrenching. And it hadn't been long maybe a year. And so her heart was still freshly wounded. But Katrina, amazing. 
her depth and fearlessness and what she will show every aspect just without reservation it seems not very many actors or actresses can do that where they lack restraint really where she just dives in and does it now what about frank in this episode this is where i think for the first time we can really say that there's a love triangle almost because he's fighting a ghost he's fighting the ghost of a wife he used to know and he's fighting the ghost of a man he doesn't believe exists until he thinks maybe there's something to it. He's trying. He loves her so much. He kind of loves the idea of her. He loves who he used to know, and he wants to love this Claire. He's in wholeheartedly, wholesale, right? And he's infertile. He gets to be a father. And in his mind, it's a very rational process, and he should be able to just step on in and they're going to have this intimate, wonderful relationship. And it's not just about the sex. It's about intimacy and they don't have it. And she doesn't have it to give. And it's heartbreaking. It's going to be beautiful to see that unfold because it's multidimensional when you get the visual and what Tobias Menzies brings to it is man, You just want to snuggle Frank. He's a good man. Yes, he can be selfish. He's flawed. But that's the joy of these characters is they are written in full dimension. They are not written flat. They're whole characters. He's trying to be so compassionate and patient and loving, but it's the disappointment and the frustration and the hurt is brimming underneath. And when they have that fight and it all comes out and again, it's not about the citizenship per se. It's not about her independence. It's about the lack of intimacy and her distancing herself and him feeling lonely. And she said that she kept that promise of not talking about the past But that wasn't it. She's still gone. She's still not there, even though she's going through all the emotions, except they're not physically intimate and they're really not emotionally intimate. She's not allowing it. I don't know if she can. I try to think in that position, could I? I don't think so. I think I would be walled up and I'd have to keep everything to myself or I'd fall apart. And I think that's where she's at as a character. And she can only hold it together. And then she's going to be only able to mother Brie. Like she can't do all of it. There's so much of her. There's such a hole and so much damage that this is what she can offer. And it's not very much. And at the end of that fight, he says he didn't make her do anything and that she can leave if she wants. But if she stays... She needs to mean it. And it's fair for him to say that. Absolutely fair. Part of Claire wants to stay. Frank is familiar. She knows him. He's trusted. He's a good man. And she tries. She wants to try. She wants to believe they can rebuild their marriage. And she wants to believe they can have those things. And in the joy and bliss of having the baby in her arms, she kisses him back and she says, you know, how much she wants it to be a fresh start. I think she's earnest in it, that that's sort of a foreshadowing behavior that I think we're going to see later on with Jamie in a particular relationship that happens where he wants to try. He's missing it. He wants to do that thing, but that thing doesn't come cheap and it doesn't come easy and it doesn't come just because you want it. So I look forward to seeing how that relationship dynamic between Claire and Frank, how it works or doesn't work. And he sticks in for the long haul to, with a wife who 
might try, but it's shallow. It's hollow. She doesn't love him that way. She doesn't want him that way. I can't imagine how hard that would be. Would I raise my children to get them grown and sacrifice that part of myself for the sake of them? Yeah, I think I would. I think a lot of people do that. And I think that's what Frank does. He chooses to stick by Claire and keep her safe and do the things that he needs to do to help her. But he gets to be a daddy and he gets to raise Brianna. And that may have been his purpose, is raising another man's child. And he said he never wanted to adopt or raise another man's child. So it is a serious work of love for Frank to do that. It's a humbling of Frank to do that. And I'm glad to get to see his perspective so fully and makes my heart break for him too. They're all a mess. And he's the most whole of the three of them. But he has holes anyway because he's not being loved the way that he needs to be. He's not being accepted the way that he expected to be. And he was hopeful and maybe a bit naive that they could just turn it back on again. (sighs) They had some pretty harsh words, Claire and Frank, didn't they? She accused him of just wanting a fuck and she's sure he could find a young woman who would love his accent. And then he threw back in her face that she'd been the one who was fucking somebody else. Pretty low blows by both of them. And Claire's the one with the more fiery temper, but we get to see what would Frank do? He doesn't shy away from a fight. He's definitely more reserved than she is. But when it comes out, it comes out. (laughs) And I think of the two, she's still the most stubborn and the most defiant, and it would take her longer to soften. You know, she did soften after the birth of Brianna and waking up, and she apologized for being so terrible to him. And she's earnest but I don't know if she can fulfill that promise or that quest at all. You know, so as we look through this episode and look at these actors, like Tobias was astounding as he brought the malevolence of Black Jack and that conclusion to that relationship with Jamie. I mean, they fought until they couldn't stand and he just fell on him, right? He gave Jamie a near-fatal wound, and Jamie gave him a fatal wound. And then Tobias can bring this beautiful humanity that just crushes us with Frank. He wants it so badly, and he does stick up for Claire, and he wants her to be her, even though it's hard for him. He wants what's best for her, even though it's maybe not best for him. He is good. I like Frank. I don't necessarily like them together. I've always said that because I don't think they were a match after the war. But they're going to make it work. They have to for Brianna and for each other, frankly. And we have that bunny and the bird. The bunny that Jamie sees when he's laying on the battlefield that night. Does it mean this is the calm before the storm? Does it mean it's safe? Does it mean new beginnings because bunnies in spring? And then Claire seeing the bird, and for that moment she was happy. Claire belongs in nature. She belongs interacting with life and being a life giver and a healer, and she's so connected to that and the birds. Apparently there was something on Twitter and it was said that the symbolism of those would be explained later. It's like, okay, so we'll be watching out for it, won't we? 
So we come out of this episode with Jamie being reluctantly alive, Claire being reluctantly in her time, and Frank being married to a reluctant spouse, but he is committed to being a father to this baby. I think this episode was magnificent. I give it high marks. And, you know, I don't hold back (laughs) my thoughts or commentary. I think it flowed well. It answered some questions like, yes, we saw Jamie deal that death blow to Black Jack Randall. He finally was able to finish that. He killed him like he said he would, and he did. And then the irony, and probably to the great immense pleasure of Black Jack, he dies while laying on top of Jamie. I mean, really, it had to happen that way. (laughs) So I can't wait to hear what you think about this episode, call into the listener line at 719-425-9444 and leave me a voicemail. Ask your questions. Tell me your theories and thoughts. I mean, there are 12 more episodes and this adventure has just begun to the very tip of the knife's edge. You can send me an email at contact at a dram of outlander.com. When I post the podcast episode, please leave a comment on social media. I want to know. The page is big. There's almost 18,000 of you on the Facebook page. And in total between Twitter and Instagram and the website, there's like 40,000 of you. We have a community here. Talk to each other. It's amazing. And talk to me. I want to know. You know, that's really the heart of this podcast, like as you guys. And as I sat there and I thought, I don't want to do a straight up review. I just want to talk about the episode. And I think that's what I did so far. Um, The one thing that stood out for me that was so difficult was I really wanted somebody to clean Jamie's wound and suture it for him. Okay, like if they're going to send him off back to Lollybrock, somebody could have attended to his wounds. And it was so sad that Claire was not there to fix him up. She'd been fixing him up for like three years. (laughs) That was her very first act, right? When she met him was resetting his dislocated shoulder. And to see him suffering and kind words came to him, but nobody tended to him. That was difficult. And when it came to the birth part, I spent part of the day really looking at what was common in that time period. And even though twilight sleep had changed to some degree, there still was scopolamine given with another medication. Originally, it was morphine, and then it changed to some other type of narcotic to go with the scopolamine because it was calming and made them sleep where the scopolamine could make people hallucinate. Even though it was an amnesiac, it was terrible. It caused serious problems. And looking at the history of birth, and it's really frustrating because the very reason we ended up with such severe treatment in childbirth and women being put to sleep And then they would have that mask that they put on Claire was probably ether at the time, not chloroform. Could have been chloroform, probably not. Both of them were volatile. They were hard to use. Um, Forceps were often used to deliver the baby, whether because the mother was knocked out literally. And they would do wicked episiotomies and pull babies out. And so many injuries happened to mothers and babies. Women had to be tied to the beds. Otherwise, on these medications, they would try to climb out windows, open doors. 
they would do all kinds of erratic and scary behavior. Horrible. And then they would wake up and it could be the next day and they'd be clean and washed and prettied up and their babies would be bathed and dressed and put into their arms. How many women do you think were able to breastfeed after that? Most didn't in that time period. So it was rough, but how we got twilight sleep in the first place, it was the wealthy feminist women who had heard of it in Europe and they demanded and brought it to the U S they demanded that doctors bring it here because they didn't need to suffer the indignities of pain and childbirth. They didn't want to anymore and pain and childbirth And it still is, and to some degree, was really tied to the biblical thought that it was uh, because Eve had sinned that now we had pain in childbirth. I just shake my head. I mean, to think that women are either not given any pain relief or forced into being under anesthesia and having no recollection, and didn't even birth their babies. I don't even know how the babies got out. (sighs) It's a mess. It's a mess. And we are still trying to get a hold of it today, where people think that every woman should have an epidural, or they should have some kind of drugs and labor. And it's not true. It can be a fantastic tool, but it's a tool It's not meant for every woman, every baby, every labor. It isn't. And I think women are really being robbed of something beautiful by not being allowed to birth under their own power. And that's me speaking as a mother and me speaking as a midwife. There is something beyond amazing that can happen and transforming when a woman births under her own power. It's magical almost. And that is not meant for every woman, but I believe that nearly every woman can do it. I do. But I will be posting a little Outlander Science Club adjunct about twilight sleep and the history of pain management and birth. And we damaged a lot of women and we damaged a lot of babies. And twilight sleep in rural areas in this country was being used into the 1970s. And I've known women who were 20, 30 years older than me who said that they refused it, like Claire did in the books, refused it. And they were treated so poorly that they'd be left alone in their labor with nobody to support them, And they would basically do everything except for birth totally by themselves because they would not accept the drugs and they wanted to be alert and wanted to know what happened. They wanted to feel it and understand it. Yeah. It's a complicated (laughs) topic, but that really happened. And until we got different types of spinals and when the epidural really got good, in the 1980s, and it got dialed in even into the 90s when it got, okay, we get it. There was some pretty crazy stuff going on. And even epidurals have changed drastically in 20 years. And they're getting refined and they're becoming safer. So it's just an interesting topic for me. But to see, I hope how the incident in Claire's character will be that it pushes her further ahead in her quest to be a physician against all the odds that are put out in front of her, and that will be part of it. So I said that Ron Moore wrote this episode, and it was directed by Brendan Marr. Beautifully done with the changes in color and contrast and lighting, It really affected the mood. The music was, as always, fantastic. When we had the opening sequence, looking ahead to the little piece of shabby tartan, Jamie standing 
over the shore, which had to have been when Seal Island, when, yes, at that juncture, I'm getting to see some other little snakes into the rest of the season. Wow. I mean, I know Star's PR has been an overdrive, but this was fantastic. And it's absolutely better than I had envisioned it to be. So thankful we all stuck it out and got here. So I took down some notes about throughout the episode, and I have about a hundred like comments that came up. And I remember thinking, shh, it's time to watch. Like nobody talk in my house. I made everybody be quiet. And then I sang along nervously to the intro song because we all know the words and who doesn't at this point. And I'm thinking, is he going to wake up dead? What is that going to look like? Right? And we see the dead bodies and piles. And everybody, shh, shh, I need to concentrate. <laughs> And seeing the wounded killed on the field where they lay and their swords being picked up and everything just, we don't see it, but the bodies are burned afterward. And Jamie wakes up and I'm like yelling at the TV, don't let them notice, don't let them notice you, stay still. And the disordered memories flood his mind. And come, and we see the Bonnie Prince and Jamie interacting with him and the look on his face, like he had to have known that it was lost. And it was a gut punch when we see him smelling Claire's wrap and consciously accepting that she's gone. In our brief encounter with Myrta, and we don't know. And were any of you freezing while watching this? I just found myself feeling chilled and colder and colder. And when he and Blackjack see each other. Now, my husband thought that was a little bit cheesy. And my friend Gina thought it was a little over the top. And I thought... That's kind of what it would look like. Like if you zeroed in on one person and they zeroed in on you, everything else would go out of focus. Your whole intent and your whole purpose would be on that person. That's how it is when I'm catching a baby. Like 10 people can walk into the bedroom and I won't even see them, hear them, know that they're there. Because my whole focus is on a safe, healthy delivery of a baby. And I zone in so hard and so deep. All I'm paying attention to is what the mother is doing and what I need to do and what that baby is saying to me. And I think that's what this scene represents. What do you think? Because that's what I got from it. And my other thought was, it's own bitches. Like, they're going at it. This is a death match. (laughs) And at that one point, when Blackjack is stumbling, they're both battle fatigued. They have serious wounds, but they can't stop fighting. And he reaches for him and he gets close to him. And looks like Jamie's still yelling at him and his head just goes onto Jamie's shoulder and they fall. Wow. It almost looked like for a moment that they were going to kiss or something. (laughs) It's incredible. And there's such a relief when you know that Blackjack is dead, but now he's trapping Jamie, right? And we see that that I call, I affectionately call it a paperweight, the dragonfly and amber that human Roe had given Claire for their wedding. Well, she had left that with him when she went through the stones and he dropped it on the moor and it was in the old museum 
that we saw last season when she had come across it. Wow. It's interesting because I don't think in all the readings I've done of Voyager, which is many, I can't, I don't even know how many, that it never crossed my mind about her inability to use modern appliances, that it would be difficult for her and that she might struggle because it's something that she hadn't known. And that coupled with how she grew up with her uncle and then living under rations for during World War II, Claire doesn't have a lot of skills in that department, right? What was your opinion of the Dean? The words I came up with were pompous ass, smug douche canoe, um, and smash the patriarchy several times in my notes. (laughs) And insert sarcasm emoji, you know, when she says that she's happy. Yeah. And Frank did his earnestness and all earnestness to help her and to check in with her and to defend her. Sheesh. One of my favorite parts as I'm going through this kind of is through how the episode ran is Rupert saying, no, my Lord, traitors all. Because Hal said that anybody who wasn't a traitor was okay. And they all copped to being a traitor. And he was their official spokesperson. (laughs) And as we move forward in the episode, Frank really hates the baby diaper or the mini diapered tea bags. He thinks they're terrible. But Claire has become the master of the stove at this point as well. I put in here that Frank was teabagged American style, which made me laugh at myself because I'm really 12 years old, I think, sometimes. What else do you think was behind Claire wanting to be an American? Was it because she couldn't stand being English still? Was it too painful because of those connections to Culloden and to the Highlanders? And had her loyalties really changed Her patriotism changed. I think so. And she wanted to be what Brie was because Brie would have English parents, but she'd be an American. And to have that connection with her daughter. And the thing that really started the chain reaction and that bad argument that they had was Claire not allowing Frank to touch her belly and pulling her hand away. Yeah, definitely difficult. And there's a lot of people in this world that have taken on somebody else's baby, married somebody with children, married somebody who is pregnant. It's not new, People have always needed to be in relationships and cared for, and they fall in love with each other when there's all these other things going on. So this could have been very joyous, and it was really hard. I also love that Rupert was a bit of a motivational speaker. (laughs) He tried to get those boys off the hook, and then he told them what they needed to do and keep their chins up, right? He worked it. Tony Robbins may be out of a job soon. Who knows? Did you cry? I totally held it together until Rupert came and talked to Jamie. And he talked about Angus. And he can't wait to see him again. And then he stands up in front of Melton's clerk and says, Rupert Thomas Alexander Mackenzie. And he makes a joke on the way to death. And then we see Frank on the timeout couch, which looks like the most uncomfortable couch I could ever imagine sleeping in. 
and the clock is loud, and the dripping water's loud, and the refrigerator's loud, and he's not sleeping. We've all had those nights of insomnia, haven't we? Horror nights. In the end, Jamie is impossible to kill. Claire tries, and she wants to try. She wants to do what's right. But can she? And Frank, is he destined to be a loving and loved father? But to have a hollow marriage? He said he loved Claire more than once in this episode and she could never return it. And then that nurse, that nurse cinched it all asking where the red hair came from (laughs) and broke the spell. They were having this beautiful moment to credits. That's my thought process for this episode. I'll put some links to Culloden in the post and to Twilight Sleep. It's really difficult to find the information, even with my access to university libraries and to studies, to find good information on the exact medications that were being used with this scopolamine in the twilight sleep. Originally it was morphine, but that was so dangerous that they moved into some other medications. So we'll see if I can find anything else for you. If not, you'll get the basic stuff and we have to infer from there. I do have some old medical books. I'll have to go and dig through and see what I can find. I hope you have enjoyed this hundredth episode. I can't believe we're here. It's been quite a journey, and I'm glad to be back in with the TV show. It's going to be an excellent season, I do predict. And I would love if you're doing any of the Outlander Kitchen recipes to coincide with the episodes. Post the pictures on the Facebook page and in the group. Tag me on Instagram under Dram of Outlander. I want to see what y'all are doing. Let's even make more of a community um, than we already have. It's available to us. Outlander is a great connector. I've made so many friends that I don't know if we would have been friends without Outlander. Like, would we have given each other that opportunity and chance to be friends with each other? I'm not sure. And so where can you find me? Well, Facebook and is a Dram of Outlander page and the group you have to ask to join. Instagram and Twitter is Dram of Outlander without the A in front. Of course, the website is adramofoutlander.com. And Wednesday nights on Twitter, we have a standing chat, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern time, and we talk about the week's prior podcast. So this coming Wednesday night, we'll talk about season three, episode one, and it's always a lively discussion. Please come and join. And we use the hashtag ADOO. And tonight we did a screening at one of our local pubs with... um the Rocky Mountain Sassanox that I've been part of for quite a while. It was amazing just to be in a group of people to enjoy what has come from Diana Gabaldon's writings and to build a different layer of community, I think is so special. And that's what Outlander really does. Unlike probably any other book series besides maybe like Harry Potter (laughs) It's fascinating to me, and I'm glad to be part of it, and I'm glad to be part of your world and your weekly life, and I always thank you so much for listening. And if any of you are interested in coming on and co-hosting for a portion of an episode, drop me a line or an email or private message on Facebook, and I would love to talk to you about it. If you produce an Outlander-inspired product, 
or a service and you'd be interested in allowing me to do a giveaway with it, let me know in all the same ways and be on the lookout for a hundredth episode giveaway. I have something planned and I will put it up this week. And I know like me, you're going to watch this episode a few more times before episode two for season three comes out because we can't believe it's back after all this time. (laughs) Oh, I'm thrilled. And I'm just so overjoyed that if the tone that is set with episode one is going to be a fantastic third season. So until next time, slange of awe.